welcome to atcm the emergency medicine channel today let us discuss about fluid management in diabetic ketoacidosis diabetic ketoacidosis is a state where there is absolute or relative insulin deficiency the patient is not having insulin due to some reason most of the time this is due to missing of doses or it can be due to the requirement increasing because of sepsis or infection or any surgery trauma whatever it is so patient can have hyperglycemia that produces large amount of volume lost through urine because of this hyperglycemia and patient develop severe dehydration it can produce metabolic acidosis mostly it is a diabetic ketoacidosis sometimes lactic acidosis will add to that the most common cause is infection or sudden stoppage of insulin missing of doses and new onset of diabetes that is patient who is having diabetes occult diabetes suddenly coming into the picture when there is an infection trauma sepsis like that it is characterized by high blood sugar so don't think that blood sugar may be 500 600 700 900 it can be even simple as Uh, 250 or 350 or even in smaller sugars also sometimes it can present but mostly it will be more than 300 bicarbonate will be low that is because of the acidosis ph will be less than 7.3 and patient can have ketonuria previously we used to check urine ketones now blood ketones are available everywhere so blood ke- blood ketones are uh, very useful in diabetic ketoacidosis urine ketones also can be done in page in uh, settings where there is uh, serum ketones are not available but there are some issues with uh, urine ketones when we compare with uh, serum ketones there is not fully reliable than uh, like uh, serum ketones now causes we have already discussed that infections like pneumonia uti sepsis stoppage of insulin stroke myocardial infarction pulmonary embolism pregnancy alcohol ingestion all these things can be a cause for uh, diabetes uh, related complication that is dk triad is very high blood sugar severe dehydration due to uh, osmotic diuresis hyperketonemia with metabolic acidosis now you can see here stress or stoppage of insulin insulin deficiency and glucagon release gluconeogenesis hyperglycemia osmotic diuresis volume depletion and dehydration on the other side activation of lipolysis increased free fatty acid concentration that produces ketone bodies ketone bodies dehydration that leads to ketoacidosis sometimes what happens is this dehydration can produce severe internal uh, hypovolemia uh, and decrease circulation to internal bodies internal organs that can also produce uh, lactic acidosis so many patients who is having diabetic ketoacidosis lactic acidosis will be associated with diabetic ketoacidosis that is because reduced internal perfusion so in a, in a given patient you can have multiple cause for acidosis that means a patient can have diabetic ketoacidosis patient can have lactic acidosis patient can have increased uh, uh, like uh, urea creatinine and uh, renal failure that can produce acidosis because renal failure itself then sepsis can produce some acidosis that also may be lactic acidosis so various acid base disorders can be there in a single patient most of the time but in a, a patient who is having uh, like uh, high blood sugar trauma that patient can only have diabetic ketoacidosis so it will be a mix of uh, various type of acid base disorder most of the time but uh, when we are talking theory it is uh, pure uh, ketone body induced uh, acidosis that is diabetic ketoacidosis so there are various mechanism we have already seen you can see here the major problem is insulin deficiency so sudden stoppage of insulin or sudden increase in the utilization of insulin or sudden increase in the need of insulin can push the patient into diabetic ketoacidosis 
the ultimately ultimately the problem is hyperglycemia dehydration tissue hypoxemia or a tissue dehydration symptoms and signs you can see most of the patients may complain uh, polyuria thirst weight loss weakness nausea vomiting leg cramps blurred vision abdominal pain that abdominal pain is very important because most of these patient diabetic ketoacidosis abdominal pain is a classical feature and many patients you can see uh, we can suspect uh, pancreatitis because uh, in a patient who is having dk Uh, amylase can be elevated we may suspect pancreatitis but it is not pancreatitis at the same time patient who is having pancreatitis they also develop diabetic ketoacidosis they can have elevation the amylase and lipase both will be elevated so uh, pancreatitis can be associated with dk but uh, pancreatitis can be a mimicker in uh, diabetic ketoacidosis dehydration hypotension cold extremities peripheral cyanosis tachycardia kusmal's breathing that is very classical for all type of acidosis rapid breathing smell of acetone hypothermia confusion drowsiness coma all these things are also seen in diabetic ketoacidosis so diabetic ketoacidosis means ketoacidosis uh, ketone bodies with acidosis diabetic coma means ketoacidosis with leading to coma now there is another closely mimicking condition that is hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state here also patient can have coma but only major difference is here the problem is volume depletion is very very large comparing with dk and ketone body production will be very minimal or absent in this condition patient may not go to keto acidosis but the same patient can have both the conditions sometimes some patients can have a mix of dk with hhs some patients can have hhs with lactic acidosis so uh, in a patient who is having these type of syndromes like diabetic ketoacidosis hyperosmolar state or lactic acidosis all this all the uh, same all these problems can occur in same patient so uh clinically when we are managing the patient these things may not be a big problem but uh, uh, diagnostic uh, uh, characters are different from uh, dk to hhs so hhs volume loss is larger than dk volume loss may be 8 liters for an average adult in hhs and it may be 6 liters for dk and ketone bodies are not produced in hhs ketone bodies are produced in uh, dk Uh, acidosis is a major part of dk acidosis is not seen in uh, hhs uh, treatment will be almost similar for both the conditions you can see here the difference which between hhs and uh, dk sugars are very high in hhs sodium is high in hhs urea creatinine can be elevated in both condition it is more, more than uh, dk in hhs ketone bodies are positive in dk it is negative in hyperosmolar coma in mixed state like mixed state means patient can have symptoms of both dk and hhs it can be slightly positive bicarbonates are low in diabetic ketoacidosis it is normal in uh, hhs blood ph is low in acidosis it is normal in hhs anion gap is high anion gap acidosis in dk it is normal insulin requirement is uh, high in dk and uh, low in hhs but uh, we cannot uh, uh, guarantee that insulin requirement will be low in uh, hhs it's only a theoretical uh, uh, agreement that uh, it will, it may be low but clinically when we are managing the case the requirement may uh, depend on patient's other conditions also like a patient is having insulin resistant in one group and he has developed hhs the insulin requirement may be high in that patient so we cannot guarantee that uh, that last part will be correct in all patients now one of the major problem in dk is the deficits fluid deficit is most important then sodium deficit potassium deficit phosphate deficit magnesium deficit calcium deficit everything can be there in same patient and that most important is fluid deficit it is around 6 liters uh in a patient uh, who is having dk that is 3 liters extracellular uh, fluid and 3 liters intracellular fluid 
extracellular fluid will be mainly intravascular fluid that we have to replace with normal saline whereas intracellular fluid replacement can be a dextrose containing solution or a dns or a 5% dextrose sodium deficit will be 7 to 10 milliequivalents per kg body weight the problem with sodium is whenever the sugars are very high in our body sugars are very high there will be falsely reduced sodium level in the lab investigation so every patient who is having high blood sugar he got to go for a corrected sodium level that we are not discussing here now but corrected sodium has to be calculated before seeing what is the actual sodium deficit if there is sodium deficit uh, uh, we have to correct it but if the corrected sodium uh, is normal no need to give extra sodium for the patient potassium deficit is very very important because before starting insulin we have to see what is the potassium level in the patient whether it is a uh, hypokalemia or not we have to uh, we have to see if there is hypokalemia if you start insulin further hypokalemia can occur due to shift uh, mechanism so that has to be avoided phosphate also will be deficit in many patients uh, magnesium is also very very important because magnesium is a one important element which is required for the action of the insulin and it also prevents the potassium loss so both this uh, mechanism because of both this mechanism magnesium is one of the important electrolyte in uh, dk like potassium potassium is also very important magnesium also important calcium deficit also can occur in many patients now when we see a patient who is having very high blood sugar rapid breathing we take we always take an abg value that shows low ph bicarbonate will be low ketones bodies may be positive so that will give you a clue that patient is having diabetic ketoacidosis so we have to send a uh, blood sample for ketone bodies to the lab urine also can be sent but uh, urine ketones uh, may give a diagnosis of uh, ketoacidosis in patient in some patients some patients ketone bodies may not be present in the urine early phase of uh, ketoacidosis it may not be present and if in patient who is having renal failure also sometimes you cannot see ketone bodies so that is not a good indicator but if uh, facilities are not available for serum ketones then you can do urine ketones so serum ketone bodies should be done and uh, every day no need to see the keto, uh, ketone bodies uh, in the blood you can see the abg value or venous blood gas is also enough uh, for follow up initially abg can be done then see the uh, ph and anion gap if the anion gap is coming down by abg or vbg then that is a good indicator ketone bodies if facilities are available every day you can send otherwise it is not a requirement every day but disappearance of ketone bodies in the blood is very very important to stop the insulin infusion so abg should be done that shows high anion gap metabolic metabolic acidosis serum potassium plus sodium minus serum chloride by bicarbonate give the anion gap anion gap normally 12 plus or minus 2 that may be 10 to 14 that is the range if it is more than that it is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis this is an important uh, this is an important disease which can produce high anion gap metabolic acidosis serum potassium is also very important in early phase itself because hypokalemia is a problem in dk if you are giving insulin infusion without correcting hypokalemia further shift of potassium can occur shift hypokalemia may produce some problems clinical problems in uh, patients who is getting insulin without correcting the potassium other electrolytes blood urea creatinine osmolality all these things should be done so abg should be done first itself first sample will be an abg second sample onwards no need to prick the patient every time you can go for venous blood gas if you are not suspecting a, a respiratory problem like uh, some patients can have a respiratory problem like pneumonia and uh, as ketoacidosis in that patient we have to continuously take abg itself if we are not suspecting a respiratory problem venous blood gas is also equally uh, beneficial like an arterial analysis because we are seeing ph bicarbonate in mainly in patients who is having dk for that uh, venous sample is 
equal to almost equal to arterial gas urea creatinine is very important sodium is also important in most of the patients i have already told that whenever there is hyperglycemia there will be false reduction in the sodium for that uh, you have to add 1.6 milli equivalents for every raise in uh, 100 mg per deciliter sugar so suppose it is uh, sugars are 200 for example 1.6 will be add to serum sodium that means if the serum sodium is 120 and blood sugars are 200 from and you take 100 as normal and it is 200 add 1.6 to the serum sodium that is uh, 120 plus 1.6 121.6 like that every 100 uh, mg raise we have to add 1.6 that will give the corrected sodium if the corrected sodium is normal no need to correct the sodium by giving 3% saline or whatever it is most of the time when there is high blood sugar the sodium will be falsely low so no need to worry about that you can just monitor the patient osmolality should be calculated in all patients who is having uh, high osmolal problem like uh, hhs but even when the uh, sodium itself is high then you have to think about hhs hhs normally uh, in dk normally sodium, sodium levels will be low either corrected or uh, uh, the lab sodium itself will be low whereas in hhs uh, the sodium after correction we get a value after correction factor that will be either normal or it will be high so in that conditions giving normal saline is not a good choice we can go for half normal saline that we discuss afterwards now wbc count should be done ecg should be taken to rule out myocardial infarction hypokalemia hyperkalemia also we have discussed that hypokalemia is one of the important cause for uh, uh, problem in dk management but many patients uh, when we are treating in emergency room many patients who is having renal failure may come with dk in that actually potassium may be sometimes high also so potassium can be more as if you are taking dk as a individual entity then potassium will be low but if the patient is already having some problem like renal failure in that patient potassium may be higher also so infection screen has to be done normally we do uh, procalcitonin level uh, to get a rapid assessment of bacterial infection in this type of patients wbc count blood cultures sputum culture chest x ray all these things can be done amylase will be elevated in most of these patients who is having dk that doesn't mean that patient is having pancreatitis if the patient is having abdominal pain amylase lipase both are elevated then you can suspect pancreatitis because pancreatitis may be a trigger for dk and patients who is having dk will have abdominal pain and elevation of amylase can be there but that that doesn't tell you that the patient is having pancreatitis now we have already seen that one of the most important problem in dk is fluid deficit it is due to the high blood sugar produces osmotic diuresis and patient losing large amount of volume nearly 6 liters in an adult uh, in dk and around 8 liters in in an adult with hhs so we have to correct this uh, problem we have to start we have to put two iv cannulas 18 gauge iv cannulas then start normal saline normal saline is the treatment of choice in dk so you can give normal saline 1 liter in 30 minutes next 1 liter over next 1 hour 1 liter over next 2 hours 1 liter over next 2 to 4 hours so you can give around 4 liters in in this fashion then once that uh, in uh, intravascular volume is increased then you can uh, go for some other volume so initially it's so total the deficit may be uh, around 6 to 7 liters in that 3 uh, liters we can correct uh, in first 4 hours then you can take time and correct uh, other 3 uh, uh, to 4 liters the uh, important thing is patient may be having uh, some patient may be having severe dehydration uh, because of dk some patients can have intravascular dehydration but they may have extracellular or extravascular volume overload like patient who is having uh, chronic renal failure patient who is having liver disease patient is having heart failure they all can have 
volume overload but intravascular volume dehydration is a must for DK. So, when we are giving fluid when, even when we are telling it is 6 liters, 8 liters like that some patients may go to pulmonary edema. So, during the management we have to monitor the patient some patients may develop pulmonary edema so we have to be very careful whatever it is normally a patient who is having DK may remain require 6 liters of fluid that we have to correct over 24 hours. Now, once the blood sugar drops less than 250, we have to change the fluid. We have to change from uh, normal saline to DNS, dextrose containing solution or 5 percent dextrose. There are two important problems we are tackling here. One, if the sugars are reaching 250 and we are continuing insulin infusion, they may go to hypoglycemia. We want to prevent that and we have to continue insulin infusion and we have to give fluids. So, the DNS or 5 percent dextrose will be a better choice. Second thing is after initial correction of the intravascular volume, this patient can have extra vascular volume depletion also. For that, DNS will be a better fluid than uh, a, a simple crystalloids like uh, ringer lactate. So, uh, sorry, a normal cell. So, uh, DNS or 5% uh, dextrose can be initiated during that phase. And in child brain edema also can be prevented by this uh, sudden drop in the blood sugar. Now, next one is potassium deficit. Once you start fluid, you have to see patient uh, volume status continuously during the treatment. You have to see what is the urine output. You have to see if there is a CVP available, what is the central venous pressure. You have to see if an uh, IVC collapsibility, IVC diameter, all these things if possible you have to do. But the best uh, uh, single most uh, uh, parameter will be urine output. But uh, we know that many patients who is having diabetes uh, and diabetic ketosis, they can have kidney failure, complete renal shutdown is possible. So, in that patients, we may, may require a central line. And pulmonary edema is one of the important factor. Uh, suddenly, patient can go to flash pulmonary edema. So, that also should be taken care. Now, potassium deficit will be somewhere around 500 to 700 milli equivalents in a patient who is having uh, DK. There are two important mechanisms. One patient can lose potassium through the kidneys. When the sugars are high, potassium and other electrolytes can go through the kidney. So, that is there. Another problem is shift of the potassium. So, shifting also can occur due to high blood sugar, insulin, all these things. So, both are possible, but uh, most of these patients can have actual deficit or deficit of the potassium. So, when we are giving fluid, suddenly the blood sugar will come down, slowly it will come down, potassium can shift back to the intravascular compartment, potassium levels may high. So, before starting insulin, again check the potassium. If the potassium levels are normal only, we can start insulin infusion. Otherwise, we have to correct the potassium. Whatever way we can correct, we have to correct it. Some patients may require central line because if the, require, if the required dose of potassium is very low, we can give through the peripheral line. That maximum 40 milligrams can be given through the peripheral line. But we know that the requirement is very high here. So, most of these patients may require a central line uh, for this. We have to correct potassium before giving insulin. Remember, insulin is not an emergency treatment in DK. It is the volume resuscitation is the emergency. Then, correct the potassium then only we need to give insulin. So, if time permits we can put a central line and give potassium correction then we can go for insulin infusion. But many doctors think that insulin is an emergency treatment in DK than any other treatment. So, insulin can be given but only after correcting the fluid status only after correcting the potassium then only we should give insulin. Now, potassium can be given as infusion. If the serum potassium is less than 3.5, give 40 milligrams of uh, potassium, uh, added potassium to 1 liter of normal saline and infusion rate should not be more than 20 milligrams per hour. Serum potassium 3.5 to 5 milligrams, uh, only 20 milligrams of potassium is required. More than 5, it is not required at all and some patients may require dialysis also. So, if it is less than 
3.5 only you need to correct it if the potassium is very very low then you put a center line and correct it fast now next one is insulin infusion once you know that potassium deficit is not there or your corrected potassium deficit then you can start insulin so when we are giving fluid itself potassium uh, sorry blood sugar levels will slowly drop so initially we don't give insulin we give fluids and wait, wait for some time correct the potassium then only we will be starting insulin by the time the blood sugar level may drop down so you can give uh, the simplest way to calculate the uh, insulin uh, requirement in dk is initial iv infusion will be 0.15 units per kg that may be around 10 to 15 units you can give it as a uh, bolus dose initially you have to give it as iv uh, don't give it as subcutaneous or im because this patient is volume depleted if you give subcutaneous or im it will not go to the circulation that's why we are preferring here it as a iv not because it is an emergency condition we have to give iv infusion if you give subcutaneous or im it will not go to the central circulation it will remain there in the injection site itself so initially give fluid so that circulation is improved then start infusion of insulin initial bolus will be 1.15 units per kg body weight so a 70 kg may require around 10 units that's a average dose we start initially then you can see the blood sugar suppose it is 500 you can calculate here like 500 by 100 5 units per hour 400 4 units per hour 300 3 units per hour so initially suppose it is 500 the blood sugars are 500 you give 10 units bolus then give 5 units per hour as infusion after 1 hour you check the blood sugar if it is dropping down to 400 change to 4 units per hour if it is still 500 or 600 double the dosage like uh, you are giving 5 units now you make it 10 units per hour the problem with insulin infusion is uh, many patients may require uh, very huge doses because they all already might have developed insulin resistance due to some issue so that type of patients may require higher doses of insulin so we cannot predict how much unit may require in each and every patient it all depends on the clinical scenario very obese patients with insulin resistant may require higher doses and a new patient may require very small dose to control the dk now there is a protocol uh, yale university delta protocol you have to read about this delta protocol I, i am not able i will not be able to tell the full protocol in this presentation but many icus fall this uh, uh, follow this um, yale protocol for insulin infusion this is one important uh, insulin infusion protocol uh, can be followed in icu but the previous uh, protocol i have told is a simplest method blood sugar by 100 will give you the infusion rate here it is little complicated uh, protocol but it is a accurate method to follow in icu now blood sugar check uh, checkup you can do uh, every 1 hour normally when you are giving um, fluids or insulin the response has to be 50 to 75 mg per deciliter per hour a rapid reduction in the blood sugar may be dangerous for the patient so Uh, in any patient who, whatever may be the blood sugar suppose even if it is uh, 1000 uh, by 1 hour we have to reduce it only by 900 next hour it has to be reduced to uh, 800 like that only we should reduce we no need to reduce from 1000 to 500 in 1 or 2 hours so that much high bolus is not required a small reduction itself is uh, enough in patients who is having dk some uh, uh, some doctors may try to reduce very fast blood sugars from 700 to 400 by giving very high doses that is not required because high blood sugars are not the priority here here the priority is the volume resuscitation potassium correction correction of the acidosis not controlling the sugar very rapidly rapid blood sugar reduction can have more dangerous problems in cns cells than uh, advantages especially in children so if the patient develops hypoglycemia then you have to manage it according to the 
blood sugar values i have seen the values here so i am not going to discuss that here but uh, patient should not go to hypoglycemia at any point in dka management we have to take care of that because in a short term uh, settings hypoglycemia is more dangerous than hyperglycemia because hypoglycemia if we don't notice and the if patient goes to hypoglycemia and uh, damage to cns cells that creates more problem uh, during recovery phase than hyperglycemia now bicarbonate therapy is a controversial issue in uh, dk we know that dk is mainly due to dehydration ketone body production if you give bicarbonate you can uh, uh, you can mask the uh, acid base disorders in dk it will not uh, it will not correct the issue in dk so giving bicarbonate is not beneficial in dk it sometimes can produce a volume overload and uh, sometimes can produce uh, other issues so we don't prefer uh, bicarbonate uh, infusion in patients who is having dk correction of the ketone bodies correction of the dehydration itself is more than sufficient in patients who is having uh, acidosis here uh, there are uh, some guidelines say bicarbonate can be given like patient who is having shock coma severe acidosis uh, cardiac problems Uh, respiratory dysfunction severe hyperkalemia they are all some of the major indications for bicarbonate therapy but routinely as such uh, we don't prefer to give uh, bicarbonate in a patient with uh, dk now supportive therapy is very important we have to catheterize the patient we have to see the intake output chart we have to see uh, what is a uh, like uh, we have to see whether the patient can be and given feeding through rails tube so rails tube has to be inserted central venous pressure has to be monitored plasma expanders uh, or uh, sympathomimetics uh, should be started if the patient's bp is still persistently low antibiotics are required in patient who is having sepsis magnesium correction is very very important because uh, magnesium correction without magnesium correction potassium will not be corrected and the action of insulin highly dependent on magnesium levels in our body so we have to correct magnesium in patients who is having any type of diabetes including diabetic ketoacidosis there are a lot of complications can occur during the treatment uh, there are different type of acidosis we already told that lactic acidosis can be associated with uh, dk another problem is hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis that can be produced during large volume resuscitation by normal saline so that is not a clinical issue uh, it will not produce any major clinical problem but it can produce some uh, uh, diagnostic errors during uh, management of dk cerebral edema can occur in children especially when the blood sugars are rapidly dropped down uh, so that has to be avoided uh, we we already discussed that um, in the average reduction in the blood sugar may be 75 to 100 mg per deciliter per hour ards can occur in some patients dic can occur in some patients renal failure shock cardiac failure all can occur in patients who is having multiple problem like sepsis trauma pregnancy all these things and one more important issue is many doctors suddenly withdraw the insulin infusion from the protocol once the sugars are controlled they stop the insulin that is not correct these patients can sometimes ha- can have rebound uh, dk so it is always better to continue insulin infusion till the patient is clinically better clinically stable patient is able to take oral feeds ketone bodies are negative watch the patient uh, suddenly withdrawing the insulin infusion can sometimes produce problem in icu patient may go to rebound ketoacidosis acidotic state so you can remember the dk management like this airway should be taken care breathing should be taken care circulation should be taken care history should be taken care blood sugar values should be taken uh, every hourly uh, electrolyte should be checked abg should be checked fluid management is very very important normal saline is the best choice in dk glucose monitoring hourly should be done by glucometer hypokalemia should be corrected hypoglycemia should be prevented by adding dns after 250 uh, 
milligram per deciliter of blood sugar insulin infusion initially 0.13 units and uh, the dose continuous infusion dose can be uh, calculated by uh, blood sugar by 100 that will give the infusion rate per hour uh, if the sugars are very high after one hour then double the dose if the sugars are coming down then reduce the dose suddenly don't stop the insulin infusion always uh, have a uh, insulin infusion continuously on board and uh, ch changed uh, add uh, subcutaneous insulin along with in, uh, insulin infusion then after half an hour or one hour watch the patient and stop the infusion jvp should be monitored for uh, fluid status ketone bodies in blood should be checked lower dose of uh, infusion should be continued till the patient is having uh, fixed dose monitor all the parameters what is written here so we have discussed about one important condition that is dk what we have understood is the major problem in dk is volume loss volume loss should be corrected with normal saline once the sugars are reduced less than 250 you can add dextrose containing solution ketone bodies are positive in blood uh, during decay till the ketone bodies are negative we, it is better to continue the insulin infusion the third problem is hypokalemia hypokalemia can be due to potassium loss or potassium shift whatever it is without correcting potassium we cannot start insulin infusion once the potassium is corrected we can start insulin infusion with 0.15 units per kg body weight initial bolus then continue as infusion it is always better to continue the infusion protocol till the patient is clinically better suppose the patient is having sepsis even if the patient does not have dk after one or two days it is better to continue insulin infusion till the patient's sepsis part is corrected so insulin infusion in an only dk you can uh, stop it once the ketone bodies are negative or once the patient is stable taking oral feeds uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis has become normal you can switch to subcutaneous but in a patient who is having an added problem like myocardial infarction sepsis shock trauma till the patient is uh, clinical condition is better better to continue the insulin infusion